Hey, Brian. What happened today? SpaceX, uh, they launched their Falcon 9 last night. It was SES-12. Oh, well, that's pretty cool. I guess that counts as today. Well, there was that other thing, too. Uh, well, Google I.O. was like four weeks ago, and Microsoft already b- bought GitHub, so what else could there be? So Apple was working on their next desert OS, while Google was working on their next dessert OS. This is an Nexus Special, episode 59. WWDC 2018 on Monday, June 4th, 2018. And now, types of files into piles of files. This episode of the Nexus Special is hosted by Brian Mitchell and Ryan Rampersad. Find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash ns59. Actually, several desert, well, one desert OS and several other OSs. OS, OSE? That's, that's too much. Too many of them. To throw more acronyms at you, we're talking about WW, WWDC 2018. Now, as we learned on um, you know a few weeks ago that you know this this was going to be the year of the hardware at WWDC, and by learned a few weeks ago, I mean well, uh, completely misled. Yeah, no, no hardware today. So uh, here in the show notes, I have pre-compiled a list of uh, extra additional sources that you can go to to find out the complete keynote, the short keynote, and the summary version of the keynote. Uh, I also have linked here uh, Brian's tweets of the entire keynote. And we're going... You have one tweet? And I'm saying tweet because I tweeted a lot. Oh yeah, he did tweet a lot. I'm showing my enthusiasm. Uh, um, It's it's showing. (laughs) Um, And then we're going to go through some of our highlights. We're not going to go through everything, but we're going to go through most of the things. Yes. So the the keynote opened with a nice uh, nature uh, nature nature documentary style video of the developer, uh, interesting the elusive developer, developer, a rare a rare mammal. They showed you know planes flying in. I, it was sounded like David Attenborough yep, or some. That was him. Yeah. Sweet. I was right. My tweet is accurate. Yeah, it's pretty funny. As you all see, as you go through all my tweets, uh, I think yeah, it was one of the better intros that I've seen. Um, so uh, of course we'll begin yeah. here with the uh, iOS. Yeah, so they they open it right up saying they're focusing on performance, um, uh, things like opening apps, opening the keyboard, swiping over to the camera from the lock screen. They're all open faster. I think a lot of it was between forty to seventy percent faster. And they kind of made and, a big deal about yeah. this um, in terms of, you know, this 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 um, what they were showing on the screen was an iPhone six doing these actions. Which is pretty good, considering the uh, iPhone six is pretty old now. Yeah, it'll be five years old this no. Four four years old this fall. Yeah. Um. But they have device, you know, the the iOS twelve will be supported back to six years, so the iPhone five S and newer will still support it. Amazing. So that's they of course had the the numbers to compare against Android, but brutal yeah, numbers. Think, yeah. The but who is it? Craig Federighi started by saying they're focusing on performance and um, security and, you know, trying to just lock in and solidify the OS. Yeah. Which I think pretty much everyone's going to be happy about. I think so. Um, so they started with some new social features like uh, new and emojis, uh, something called Memoji, which is basically a way of creating your own emoji in Apple's kind of emoji style that is 3D tracked with your face. They so added tongue support. What's kind of well, cool so can, about yeah. the AR emoji stuff or the uh, Memoji is that it's like Samsung's AR emoji, but it's not bad. It's actually good. So instead of just taking a picture of your face and then going digital, it, it lets you make it so you can look however you want, which is nice. Yeah, so it, it mirrors like if you open your mouth or wink an eye or move your eyebrows around. Yeah. It, it's pretty cool. Um, they introduced AR Kit 2, which is more... Uh, focused around sharing and collaboration. It's pretty they had good. a big long demo from Lego about um, they had one Lego set on the stage and they were moving the iPads around and multiple people were interacting and you know pressing buttons and they did some things where they're overlaying what you could actually see in person with like a breakout of what's inside the Lego set. And then there was this um, like game that was sort of like Angry Birds but it was just slingshots and blocks but with two people which is pretty cool. And a bystander or like a an observer. Mm-hmm. I think they said it supports up to four people in the scene at once. It's pretty good. And then next year, 
uh, there will be group FaceTime AR, whatever. AR time. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> oh, oh, wow, you you did it. Um, so they they made a first party built in AR measuring app. Yeah, it looks quite accurate. They showed measuring the length of a table, taking kind of a a look at a photo. I think you know a six and a half, four and a half by six and a half, or four by six, whatever that's. I don't know if real photos. Yeah, do you? No, I I don't I don't use paper. <laughs> um, Same. So they have a new file format called USDZ. You tell me. Uh, they made this with Pixar, um, and there's support from Adobe for all their Creative Cloud applications. So it's kind of like a, a 3D version of images and video. So it's like a fully rendered 3D scene that you can kind of zoom in, pan around, spin, um, that you can embed in applications. They showed a demo of it inside the news app. I'm wondering if this will be able to be put into web pages or, or anything like that, if it's just a, a, you know, a file with some texture and scene information. Yeah, we'll have to see about that. It's some of these file formats. Last year, Apple made some kind of new like JPEG compatible format, and I don't really think it's been going outside of that ecosystem so far. H e i c. Yeah, sure. I think Android picked that up as their default too. Def- I don't know. At least support not. for it. I think it's just out there and being used, and not people aren't really noticing big differences. That's good. Is my thought, which is the way you want it to go. I agree. Um, I bet uh, USDZ will let people create new 3d models and things and share them around from iPads so they can, you know, kind of mold, mold things and share them with each other. I bet yeah. it'd be kind of popular with creative applications for kids and mm-hmm. classrooms and things. Um, you can now do more intelligent photo sharing and Siri search suggestions inside the photos app. Um, and you can do kind of a share back. So you share some photos to someone, it'll kind of intelligently share photos back to them. I'm sure you can approve it and, um, you know, block that if you want to um, i think that's kind of run through imessage um a uh, new cool big thing is siri shortcuts so do you remember a year ago when the the workflow app was acquired by apple right like a few weeks before wwdc yeah i, I happen to have that date right here on my calendar yes it was uh it was may a, 23rd it was a big, 2017 it was a big day that it probably wasn't that day anyway i've been following these guys on twitter for a long time back since the jailbreak days um, they made an app called Workflow. It was acquired about a year ago. And we've just been kind of sitting on our hands waiting to see. And by we, I mean me and other people on Twitter who I follow who are enthusiastic about it. Like Federico Vitici, mostly. Um, so it's, it's it's kind of a cool thing. I think what's interesting is that it came out now um, sort of after the wave of uh, Android implementations of this. So... Um, at Google I.O., I think they rolled out this stuff for um, Google Assistant. And then Bixby, for whatever reason, also had this probably in February of this year. So oh, some, somehow Samsung was actually early to something. Hmm. But yeah, it lets you define um, so a series of actions that you do. So they had examples of, um, in a demo, when you said, I've arrived or what's uh i don't know something about traveling so it would load up the kayak app to get your address um and so you could kind of define an action and just trigger it on a siri keyword or they had one saying i'm leaving work and it would text someone that you're leaving work it would pull up your route for navigation and it would turn on a radio app to start playing the radio station you want to hear in the car on the way home that's pretty good yeah and so it's and, and workflow has been able to do that today but now that's kind of getting built into siri and you can trigger it with your voice and that seems quite powerful. So we've um, got uh, a, f- a few new apps available for the iPad, which we'll talk more again about later, which are socks and voice memos. It's pretty nice. Yep. Uh, another new feature in iOS is do not disturb bedtime. So uh, traditionally in iOS, for the last, I don't remember when they had do not disturb. I think it was iOS 6, actually. So several years now. Um, You can turn on Do Not Disturb, and you can even then do a schedule, so it'll turn on and off at certain times. But now there's a bedtime mode where um, it'll just alert you on the weather, and then it kind of clears everything out So and kind of turns the screen dark. So if you wake up in the middle of the night, you you can just check the time and not have to see all these notifications that might stress you out and prevent you from going back to sleep. That's, That's really nice. I like that feature. Yeah, I'll totally use it. Yeah, I'm excited. So then they have um, group notifications so that um, similar notifi- similar notifications can stack together. 
It's pretty yeah, nice. I don't know if this was within one app or one time period or more intelligent, like if it can detect the text in the no- in the notifications themselves and group them together. But So that way when your 15 friends, I mean your 32 friends, um, all text fire, they can all go into one message instead of 20. Yeah. yeah. So we'll have to see how that grouping works. I'm excited to see that because sometimes if I'm away from my phone for a number of hours, I come back, it's just awful. Right. So, much so, when, so when you get your 330... Um, tweets you don't have to see every single one or when you and brandon are talking about react native and the technical <laughs> channel of our slack <laughs> that has never have... happened never. ever <laughs> um okay so they have um something called activity board which lets you, which helps you limit times in apps and it, it just overall helps you know how you use your phone and it also has some of those settings so that um if you have kids sort of like in a in a parental control version it can also be applied to your kids devices too yeah, so you can see things like how often, how frequently you turn on your phone, how much time you are in apps, and you can limit it to say, like, I only want to look at Instagram for one hour today, and then it'll show a message when you're there, and it'll give you an alert saying you only have five more minutes. I think that's um, really nice. I um, I think if I used it, I would be shocked to find that I don't use my phone that much. I think I'll set myself to limit Twitter use to two hours a day. I cannot, I don't know how anybody <laughs> could use Twitter for that long. I feel like it probably gets there at some point. I don't know. And I think maybe, maybe like not engagement though. Like maybe I have Twitter open on my computer, maybe for two hours total a day, but I'm not using it for that long. Yeah. Where I'm at lunch eating and I'm checking through some tweets and then I set my phone down without turning off the screen and I'm talking with people and it sits there for two minutes before the screen goes to sleep. Yeah. I don't want that to count. Oh no, it's going to count. That's great. Yeah, probably. Oh, um, so now there's also new Animoji and new Memoji. We talked about that a little earlier, but um, uh, there is a live version of it in the camera app. So you can lay it, layer it over yourself and have new filters and Animoji, Memoji, or I like to call it Meme-ogies, um, over your So you can like, they showed you could take a Memoji and it literally replaced your head, like shadows and all. It looked pretty cool. Um, and also new in iOS 12 is group FaceTime. So up to 32 people. Um, and you can do Animoji in FaceTime as well. And they showed Tim Cook with a great Memoji of himself over his head. You know, it's kind of funny that, um, you know, I think I think FaceTime and Hangouts probably came around at the same time, or at least within a couple of years of each other. And FaceTime is still getting the same features that Hangouts was getting, but now Hangouts barely even exists. Yeah. What a time to be a chat app in the world. (laughs) I do think FaceTime is native. So I think the performance is a little different than Hangouts, at least on desktop. Hangouts is in browser and uses a plugin, actually. It's native on Android. Probably is on on iOS as well, but I don't know. Yeah. Technical Uh, details. Let's talk about uh, watchOS and what happened to it. Yeah, so... Um, just to, to start off with something that came out after the keynote, um, it turns out the watches that are supported by watchOS 5 are only the Series 1 and newer. So the original Apple Watch is no longer supported in watchOS 5. So that means all of the people who bought $18,000 24-karat gold Apple Watches can't run the latest version after just three years. I hope they're happy. <laughs> it's, now, it's a, it now, it's, it? now it's a family heirloom. Yeah, exactly. Vintage. Yeah. And that's and, and you know hipsters love vintage. Oh yes. Um, yeah. So to start off with, there are now activity competitions. So you can challenge a group of people over a course of a week. You know who gets the most points. It seems like they had a new point system. It wasn't just like calories burnt or anything. Um, so it probably aggregates a bunch of that together, and I think probably bases it off of your your history or something too. So it it's probably auto handicapped based on your past history. I would hope so, at least. Um, there are retroactive start and stopping of workouts. Um, I don't know the, all the details on this. You might still have to start it at some point during your workout, so your watch knows if you are walking versus biking, for example. Um, actually, I don't think biking was a supported workout in there, but One year. apparently it'll auto-detect when you stop working out, too. Someday. Which I know I've I've sat recording podcasts in the summer before in the studio, and I look down at my watch and see that I've been cycling for an hour while I've actually been sitting. They, and these that's a good these way podcasts to... are very stressful on your body. Yeah, it's like it gets my heart going. It's going uphill. 
<laughs> um, so now, uh, this is a cool feature. It's walkie-talkie. I think it's pretty nice. Yeah. I f- am I right in remembering that I think this was a, a teased feature when they announced the Apple Watch, but, you know, months before they actually released it? Wasn't walkie-talkie something in there? I'm, I'm or sure, is that just me? I'm sure it was mentioned sometime or at least rumored, but I don't... It never ne- didn't exist. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of... It beeps at each other and it uses either wi-fi or cellular well because you know they had that um weird drawing scribbly thing instead yeah um Uh, digital touch yeah and that that was the that was the more immersive gimmick whereas walkie talkie is a little bit lighter yeah um so cool so um now we have the siri watch face um complications um that are going to be open for developers um so they can make actual what third-party ones now yeah i think this is probably just a new complication type maybe even an existing one so there have been complications on different apple watch faces so they're just different sizes of of data and a few different lines of text so i think this is just a new one that you can incorporate into the siri watch face so So it's not just in case anybody wants to know a complication is really just a clever word for a widget yes basically yeah but we know we, we know Apple likes inventing new words. It, they like to be complicated. <laughs> oh, um, so now you don't need to use "Hey Siri." Make sure you play this near an iPhone. Um, you don't need to use "Hey Siri" to trigger uh, Siri on your watch. So you just hold up your wrist and I'll just listen. Yeah, you no longer have to say "Hey Siri." I hope you were playing this. So that your iPhone could hear you. Okay, I held my iPhone up, but it didn't. It didn't make the noise. Well, I'm sorry. Next time, I've failed. Next time. Um, yeah, I I'm looking forward to that because I've been driving in the car and I just want to like play a playlist and I hold my Apple Watch and I have to struggle for it to trigger Siri and then I talk and sometimes it just stalls and doesn't actually hear me because I it's been, it's been too long since I triggered it. But between the animation of it showing up and then, bleh. yeah, if it's just always listening, great. Yep. Uh, so now WebKit is now on WatchOS. Um, I don't know how you get to one of these websites, um, but it, it it will show you a website and it'll sort of render, uh, you know, sort of slowly. So it will, it might tap you when it's ready and it will also try to optimize the experience by going into read mode if it can or just trying to squish down the display. And, you know... Apple's pretty good at squishing down the display. They they had a really small phone size for many years, so they're used to it. Yeah. So this is mostly for use in the mail app. Oftentimes, emails are formatted as HTML. And every email I, I read on my Apple Watch, there's a big message in blue saying, you can't display this message because you're not, you know, you don't have, you can't render the HTML. And then it somehow shows me the text anyway underneath it in plain text. So I guess I just don't read email on my watch. So I guess that's weird. Yeah. But I think it would also be when someone might send you a text message with a link in it or something. Yeah. You might try to render it. That could happen. Um, so this one's cool. There will now be a, the Apple Podcasts app on the watch, which is great for everybody listening to this episode. Hooray. Yeah, this has been something long time coming. Um, podcasts are a thing that, you know, they're long audio formats or audio files. So they're, you know, 100 megabytes often. Yep. And so that's not something you want to stream over cellular. No. It takes a lot of bandwidth and power, power to stream it. So you want to be able to preload it up, and there hasn't really been a good way to do it. The only I know of two apps that have done offline podcast support, but they're kind of hacky, I think. One of them is Workouts Plus Plus, which is really a workouts app, but there's a podcast tab because through WatchOS 4, you can do background audio if you're in a workout app because there's background workout app API support, but not for audio. <laughs> so, so if you kind of splice audio into it, it works. But now in WatchOS 5, you can do background audio. So what Marco, Marco needed to do was happy. make a new app called Overrun, and you, you <laughs> jog and listen to a podcast. Well, that's what uh, David Smith did, who, or underscore David Smith, who uh, write, wrote Workouts Plus Plus. Okay, well, that, the name um, isn't as good, but I, I'll, I'll accept it. They also introduced background yeah. audio support, so now they have a, an API directly for this purpose. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited to see what comes out of that. We'll see. I. Um, I kind of felt like the whole watchOS section was sort of sort of empty. Uh, it makes you wonder if they're making actually new hardware for later this year or if they're just going to wait until next year. We'll see. Yeah. I don't know. 
Yeah. I'm hoping like a Spotify app comes to Apple Watch too. I think a lot of people would use that. Mm-hmm. Um, and they did a demo of the Apple Watch with all these new features with a woman on a, a bike cycling the whole time. It was like a four minute demo and she was trying to use the new activity competitions with her uh, brother, I think it was. And then did like a walkie talkie with her uh, daughter on stage too. So that was kind of cool to see. Mm-hmm. So that brings us to TVOS. Yes, we have three points for this. That's all that I remember. First one is Dolby Atmos. Oh, it's now I the only. It. I yeah, I don't really know what the different. I know it's it's fancier. You need a crazy crazy studio to master for it. Why well, have seven point one sound when you can have ninety point one sound? Yeah, I think Dolby Atmos scales to like two hundred speakers or something crazy. I was I close. It's. And and so what's yeah. better than ninety speakers? Well, what's better than single sign-on? It's zero sign-on. So this uh, will have to work with certain cable providers. So they're starting in the U.S. at least with Charter, I think it was. So so to be honest, this is nothing they should have been proud about. It's very bad. I think it was very in, in poor taste, I think, of even making, even claiming this as a feature. Like, this is what so many of the set-top box makers do, especially for... Um, Comcast directly like a Comcast box knows that it's you know on the Comcast internet so it doesn't need to do additional authentication nobody likes yeah. any of this everybody should just play fair if the u- user experience is awful that is how it should be in order to get through it um, yeah. I don't know I was I was disappointed in their spin on this yeah so it, it gets all the user stuff through the internet connection to make sure you know, it checks with the ISP to make sure you are who you say you are based on what network you're on. It means they're watching you. Yeah. And one thing on Dolby Atmos, it's the only um, set-top box to support both Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos. So, hooray for you, cinema files. And audio files. And video files. And Apple files. Yes. And one of the most important features of tvOS is... You can now have your aerial screensavers with captions. So you can see where that awesome video that you're seeing actually is. And they're introducing a new screen or aerial screensaver, which is video taken from the ISS. Which is, it looked really nice. Yeah, it's both daytime and nighttime. I'm super excited to see it. I can't wait. And they also added support so you can scan through these screensavers and watch them. I've, I've actually caught myself spending an hour sitting in front of my TV watching these. Probably, you know, like kind of twilling on my phone, but also looking up for 30 seconds at a time watching these screensavers. You know, I think you need this new feature called Activity Board. <laughs> Shh. Uh, I don't so, know if it supports Apple TV. Uh, not yet. Um, so that that brings us to uh, Mac OS, formerly known as, what was the last one? High Sierra? Yes. What is the new formerly name? Formerly known as, uh, the new one is Mojave. Mojave. And what is the new number? Is it 11? Uh, unclear, but likely 10.14. Okay. Yeah, actually, someone from Apple tweeted 10.14, so... There you go. 10.14. It. It's revolutionary. It's wonderful. It's magical. Um, they kind of jumped right in with system-wide dark mode. It's pretty so this, pretty dark. Yeah, this is something that kind of leaked on Sunday through uh, an API in the Mac App Store that wasn't being used but was public, and so there's a video of dark mode for Xcode app. Um, but it's actually system wide, so you can um, now change not just the menu bar and the uh, dock, but the the appearance and all kind of standard windows across the OS. So I think there are a bunch of new classes or new features in classes. Um, I think some of the UI appearance stuff in AppKit has supported dark mode for a while. I've seen people talking about this, like hints of dark mode stuff being there since at least El Capitan. Maybe even Yosemite. So it's it's been a, a hinted thing that I think we've kind of seen coming for a little while. Well, everybody loves a good dark mode, especially when more than one app is in it. So yeah, um, it's, it's yeah. I was watching this keynote in a super dark theater room with like a awesome laser projector. This projector is like the best thing I've ever seen. It's amazing. Um, but I had like I had Slack open, and then I had. Tweetbot for Mac in the dark theme in front of it, and Slack was just super bright and blinding. I just wanted dark mode everywhere, and this would have solved my problem. Yep. Okay, so we have dynamic desktop. 
So this is something that I think Android does and GNOME does, but the <laughs> Linux distro. For those desktop. who are interested in those Linux operating systems. I know at least one of the listeners do- is, but um, yeah. So the wallpaper can change throughout the day, different Ooh. colors, times of the day. Great. Cool. So, so we, like don't, we don't know the, the, the very minute details on this. It might just be that they come preloaded with, you know, a set of wallpapers that you know, basically our time-lapse video and that it just toggles the video through the day during the day. Yeah. Probably just steps, you know, a new frame every hour or half hour. Yeah. Know, something something yeah. like that. So it, it's a nice feature. Um, you know, Android has a feature similar to this. Um, I don't know what it's called, but it's like a live wallpaper and they can change through the day. It's pretty nice. Yeah. So then we have stacks on the desktop and do you, do you want me to say it or do you want to say it? Please, please okay. say it. So stacks on the desktop allows you to arrange types of files into piles of files. Yes. Oh, that's <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> um, and, it, and, and so when I was watching this on the screen, I thought, wow, I would never use that. But then I realized all that ever goes on my desktop is screenshots. So <laughs> this is perfect because now all my screenshots can just go into a, a pile called screenshots or I don't know. PNGs, so it's cool. Yeah, uh, I don't know exactly how they're sorting them, but they're piles of files, and it makes your desktop look less cluttered. And you kind of scrub through them. And so I think I think one thing that would be interesting is if the piles of files. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, Craig kind of demoed this feature, and he he was um, he dragged a file from some website to the desktop, and then it zoomed off into its pile. But it would be interesting if there was a way to keep a file out of a pile. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if there's uh, yeah. uh, pile exclusions. I, I don't know. File pile exclusions. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, so there's gallery view, which replaces the old view called cover flow. Um, it looks kind of similar to the, um, I think it was called film strip view for Windows users. Uh, if you're one yeah, of those poor, sounds right. poor people. Yeah. Um, but what's cool about this is that it's um, a really nice way to see a thumbnail, but also some a, a single larger one that's currently in focus. And then on the right side of the finder, you can see the get info bar or info is now been inlined, which is nice. Yeah, all that metadata. And there's some um, contextually aware actions that you can do. I think similar to the share sheet in iOS. So you can share a, a file or a group of files and you can do actions. These are like widgets and extensions that have registered themselves as available to perform actions on certain file types. And so you can, they showed an example of taking a few images and like a document and creating a PDF out of them. So simple things that would normally be a little more complicated to do, but now it's easy in line right there. There's a new screenshots utility so, you know, everybody loves hitting Command Shift 4 spacebar to take a screenshot oh, of a thing. The best. It is the best. And now there's a an app. Is it it, it was an app, right? Like, um I'm not exactly sure. I think it's really similar to how it is in iOS. So when you take a screenshot, traditionally on Mac OS, unless you change some and uh defaults through the terminal, um, would be just sent to your desktop it now kind of hovers in the bottom right corner similar to how in ios when you take a screenshot it goes to the bottom corner yeah and, and then it's you really can, nice because then when yeah. you click on it it'll open into this little editor thing and you can crop it and do yeah, stuff you can do markup or whatever you want or save it or delete it you can even just drag it from that little preview into whatever app you want to use it and then you never have to deal with the file and deleting it and right stuff. so then you won't need to put your screenshots into piles of files yes <laughs> um, um and they pulled in the quicktime screen recording feature into this area too so i you so. know I, I i didn't get to read more into this but i wondered if they were clever enough to add additional export formats um i have an app i don't know what it's called um but it lives in the little you know icon tray up on top there and yeah. it um lets you record a video of your screen, but then lets you export not only to, you know, MP4 or whatever video it is, but also lets you export into GIF and WebM, I think. Hmm. And it's kind of yeah. cool because that way you can actually share it in a smaller size and less, you know, less video-y and more webby. Yeah. Uh, so existing in QuickTime, you can export it to different formats that QuickTime supports. Yeah. But 
GIF and WebM are not QuickTime supported files. Probably not. Unfortunately. Yeah. Just just so. how YouTube 4K or YouTube doesn't play in anything higher than 1440p on the Mac or 1080p on the Apple TV 4K. Well, that's because, because they encode it all in VB10 and Apple doesn't want to support that. But and also because rare, rare, Apple rare. hasn't uh, made any new hardware in 10 years. Oh, okay. Um, let's talk about Safari. Um, new favicons in tabs. Yeah, that's, it that's, shows them on the tabs again. That do you is, remember how Safari used to do this years and years and years ago? It, and I miss them. It is really now bizarre. Um, also, it's funny, it's funny how anybody... Like, we are so desperate for Apple to do something that this is what we have to come up with as an important and interesting thing. Thank <laughs> there, you, Apple. There's, there's some clapping applause. in the background. <laughs> um, on a more serious note, Safari now has some new anti-tracking features, which I think are really cool. Um, so a few weeks ago I asked Ian, so what, what are the chances are of Google actually, you know, listening and putting in some more privacy oriented things into the systems and the answer was no no yep. none nope um apple of course is a little bit more privacy oriented and so in safari at least um websites will only be given a very minimal set of system info um i don't know what this entails we didn't get a lot of details on it but it might be stuff like user agent um and like display resolution and stuff like that. So it won't be able to enumerate yeah. all those details necessarily, at least not as easily as before. Um, something like fonts won't be enumerable. Only system fonts will be revealed. So they'll know generally like you're using 1014 or yeah. 1013 or 1012 based on the fonts, but they won't know more than that. And then furthermore, they're dis- disabling all third-party extensions. So there's, there's no capability of installing plugins. flash and java yeah plugins right or uh the google talk plug plugin which is how i'm talking to you right now well yeah but you use chrome for that uh no i use fire i know but you're supposed to use chrome for that <laughs> i use firefox <laughs> oh it's fine um so uh it also has a cool thing and this is sort of a um, a little shot across the bow to facebook um so on websites that have discuss things or facebook comments or you know any of those sites that allow you to make comments through another service um safari will now prompt you if you're sure you want to do that um because basically what it means is um sharing cookies across sites so that they can track you better and safari will ask if you are really sure you want to yeah i think that's a cool feature i've used the one blocker app which is using the the safari ad blocker api on both my mac and my ios devices and they have a feature there so you can block comments as well and i i like it i use it so that's pretty cool um and then uh, i think the biggest the biggest big thing is a demo of the future tell us more brian so they they uh announced they're bringing four new apps to the mac the news app stocks app voice memos app and the home app for dealing with home kit now, this might sound a lot like how a few of these, the Stocks app and Voice Memos app came to the iPad and got some redesigns there too. And I think they're all very related because they ported over UIKit versions to the Mac that run, I'm not sure if it's in AppKit or kind of side by side, but they ported over more of these iOS libraries to the Mac. So the UIs can kind of be ported over much, much, much more easily. Yeah. And this is a taste of what's to come. It's there's no developer access yet, but that'll be coming in 2019. So this this is an, uh, an opportunity for Apple to publicly declare the intent, which is to allow iOS developers to use sort of the same set of APIs on the Mac side to you know make apps and stuff. We don't know a lot of the details behind this. So for many months, there's been something called Marzipan rumors. Yep. I think that's right. And so Marzipan was you know, this sort of UI abstraction layer that would allow you to write sort of one set of stuff between iOS and Mac apps, which is great. Um, so some of the speculations that I've read so far is, so what if what if you do this, but then it also requires you to, um, it forces you to um, go into the App Store. So, you know, there, there's always pros and cons of these things. So we'll just have to see. Um, they rewrote the Mac App Store app. They did. Um, that was a really big, big change. Yeah, I, I wasn't able to watch the very end of the keynote where they're talking about this. 
Um, it sounded like some apps were coming back to the Mac App Store that had gone away. Like I think they talked about some panic applications. Yep, BB Edit, Transmit. I think that's right. Coda. Coda uh, is, tra- is panic. BB Edit is bare bones. Yeah, that one's coming too. Um, I think uh, Microsoft Office 365 yeah. is yeah. coming to the Mac App Store. What number Office? All of them. Um, yes. Yeah. So I think it's really cool. There's a lot of um, a lot of a lot of good stuff coming in that App Store. Also, the App Store has a dark mode, so that's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that pretty much does it for Mac OS. Um, a few catch-alls that I've seen on Twitter in the time be- since. I'm sure there's more that we're not covering because I have definitely not caught up in my Twitter feed yet. But uh, iTunes Connect is renamed to App Store App Store Connect. OpenGL is deprecated on Mac OS 10.14. Nah. I'm s- sure they're pushing you to keep using Metal. So so basically, the idea is that uh, nobody plays games on Mac, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. And, you know, they're prob- you probably can get better performance out of Metal than you can on OpenGL. Most likely. At least- but it does does hinder some cross-platform development. But I think they're pushing for cross-platform from iOS and to macOS versus macOS to other PCs. Yes, well... But that ch- un- that really does change un- what runs on uh, macOS. Unfortunately, so. that's going to severely hamper game development on the platform that nobody plays games on. Yep, unfortunately. Um, there's a new password manager API for at least iOS, maybe macOS. Um, so quick type can get it and safari autocomplete stuff that's very nice good that's cool i'm really really excited to use that for one password yeah um i've disabled the one password browser extensions because i'm like i don't want any security vulnerabilities there so i do copy paste it which debatably is worse but well i I would trust that more on ios than i would on something like android yeah and i think one password does clear the pasteboard after a specified amount of time yeah maybe one or two minutes but that's kind of cool and super cool you know how in uh mac os system preferences general there's a a little drop down for let me make sure i get the label right um appearance it's been blue or graphite forever like base basically since mac os 10 they have this whole drop down for two options it's not a like a radio button it's a drop down well in 10.14 they're adding more everything changed yeah, I think Grapha is a hold up back from the Platinum days, you know, Mac OS 9, when people wanted less color, they would like, okay, fine, we'll let you use Graphite to dumb it down or dull it down. But there's going to be more. I have no idea how this is going to look, but it's a thing and get ready. Dark theme and orange highlights. It's going to be great. That, that, that'll be pretty cool to see, I guess. Maybe. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And there's many more, and uh, yeah, we'll have to see what comes out this summer. So I'm excited to take a look. So we we all must lament publicly and forever the loss of our hardware event that we all wanted. Um, <sighs> yes, hopefully sometime this summer we'll get some new updated Max. I don't know, but at this point they might as well just hold them back for whenever this comes out. Speaking of which, when is this Mac OS stuff coming out and iOS stuff? Likely in the fall. Uh, iOS usually comes out end of, end of September, or middle to end of September, and macOS usually comes out in October, a couple weeks after. Cool. So, so I I always ask this at the end of every big event. So, how was this one compared to previous years? I was quite happy with it. Um, I don't think much had leaked beforehand, so I really had no idea what to expect. Um, some of the features might have been a little gimmicky, like Animoji or Memoji, but I think they're they're useful. They're going to get more people to engage with it. Um, Mac OS got a ton of love. I think a lot of features basically from iOS got moved to Mac OS and it kind of unifies it a lot more. I'm excited about that. Um, we got a tease of what's to come in the future with um, Marzipan and UI Kit on the Mac. Um, I'm really happy about the Arial screensaver captions. That's probably c- completely absurd, but let me have my moment. Uh, I like the the watchOS features of uh, competitions and some new um, APIs for background audio. I think that'll be really, really slick. Um, And then on iOS, I'm really excited about the activity board, actually, and group notifications, the new Do Not Disturb Bedtime, um, Siri shortcuts. We'll see if I use group FaceTime, probably every so often. But yeah, I think overall it's, it's pretty solid. 
and they preface the whole thing, at least in iOS, of focusing on stability or performance. And I think that's that's a good way to start. So I think we'll re- we'll really see if that pans out later this fall when all these devices update, um, because you know what people would always say: "Oh, my iOS phone just updated, and now it got way slower." So we'll see if that continues to happen, or if maybe they dialed back the um, you know performance throttling that they were doing, but did sacrifice some battery longevity or not um you know we'll just have to see yeah definitely yeah i thought it was an okay keynote um nothing nothing uh, as good as getting some good old-fashioned hardware um or it's the developer conference yes the developer conference where developers are demanding hardware um and i guess the one that i always the one that i always compare to is the the year with the swift announcement at the end of it um, that one is you, you can't top that. You can't top that, and I always I always try. And, and I and 2015 I, and I, was crazy, and I can't. Was that 2015? I don't know, but that was the best. That was the best year. Yeah, yep. wonderful keynote. Mm-hmm. I think this is up there, though. I'm I'm really quite happy with it. Yep, I agree. Cool. All right. Well, where can we find you on the internet, Ryan? Well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on my 2013 MacBook Pro, and on Twitter at Ryan Mar, and of course on my website RyanRapperSaid.com. And you can find me on the internet at Brian Mitch L on Twitter and my website, brianm.me. Uh, you can also check out the show notes for this episode of The Nexus Special at thenexus.tv slash ns59. Woo-hoo. You can also check us out on Reddit, where we are reddit.com slash r slash thenexustv. Uh, this episode is licensed with a Creative Commons attribution license, so share as you will. Give us some credit. And of course, you can also listen to this episode later this fall on your Apple Watch by subscribing to it in the Apple Podcast app. I cannot wait. And in many other apps, in fact. I mean, you can subscribe pretty much anywhere. So please do and enjoy. Someone call me out on doing this this fall when WatchOS 5 comes out. I'll post a video on Twitter. <laughs> That'd be pretty fun. Well, thanks, Brian. It was uh, always fun to talk about WWDC, and uh, I'm sure we'll be talking later in September with the uh, next iPhone. Yeah, sounds good. Have Have a good good one. one.